This meeting is being recorded. And all the participants will come in now. If there are any. Yeah, they are clicking over. Um, for those of you who um, can see us now, um, welcome. Um, we'll just give it a few more minutes to allow all the, um, the technology to catch up and then we'll start. So we'll give it a couple of minutes while all the participants get, get sent over. So welcome to you who are here. Okay, everybody, welcome to the Southwest Marine Ecosystems um, session on um, fisheries. Um, thank you for joining us on this webinar. Uh, my name is Martin Attrell. Um, I'm um, Professor of Marine Ecology at the University of Plymouth. And my job here is just to have set up the technology in the webinar and then pa pa pass it over to the people who are going to be presenting today. Um, we have four speakers. Um, the plan is for each of them to give a presentation um, and then we can move to questions and answers. Please put your questions, if you have any, in the Q&A um, box, not the chat. If you wanted to chat away to each other on the chat, that's fine. But we'll just be looking at the Q&As for questions for the speakers. So please do engage with that and, and write any questions you might have down on, in, on the Q&A part of the webinar. Um, it's great pleasure to pass over to our chair, um, Libby West from Natural England. Um, she will be chairing the session and introducing each of the speakers. Um, so I'll step back now. Um, formally welcome you again to this um this uh, southwest marine ecosystem session on fisheries and pass over to libby thanks martin um and thank you everyone joining the fisheries webinar for uh, it's the 2021 look back so it's the webinar for 2022 um always slightly confusing um and we've got some brilliant speakers lined up today so thank you to all of them um who uh, will introduce themselves um if you're familiar to this webinar series um, we sort of get cracking without too much ado so speakers will be introducing themselves um, and kind of reflecting on on their sort of perspective of uh, what was new or interesting in 2021 um, in a my, in my presentation i'll be blurring those lines a little bit um, kind of going from 2020 to, to now um, okay so let's crack on i'm also uh, doing that thing that you're never meant to do which is presenting and chairing in the same session um, so I will try to be fair uh, and not hog too much time. Um, uh, but yes, do put your questions in the Q&A and we will pick all of those up at the end, as Martin said. So I'm Libby West. Uh, I'm a senior specialist in marine and fisheries evidence in the chief scientist directorate at Natural England, which sounds very fancy. Um, I formerly worked for Devon Semnifka for quite a long time as a senior environment officer, which was an absolutely fantastic role. Uh, I've moved into a national role um, and to Natural England, where I'm kind of continuing on my interest in fish ecology and fisheries um, and kind of looking at a combination of supporting our area teams in terms of evidence and also um, sort of national policy development. So a lot of the work I'm presenting on today isn't actually being led by Natural England. Quite a lot of it is being led by DEFRA or the MMO. But I wanted to give you a feel for um, kind of quite a big shift in the policy and legislative landscape, um, but hopefully make it relevant to all of you. So can everyone see that OK? Yeah, brilliant. So uh, I'm going to start off my talk today by talking about a little bit about marine spatial prioritisation, which will probably feel a little, little bit strange when I'm meant to be giving a talk on fisheries, but hopefully the reason for that will become clear. I want to talk about our new fisheries framework, so the Fisheries Act, the Joint Fisheries Statement and the Fisheries Management Plans. Um, talk a little bit about good environmental status. Um, some of you working in marine ecology might have heard this sort of term bandied about, and it, it certainly seems to be coming up more and more. Um, why is that? what's the relevance and what's the relevance for the Southwest. I want to talk a little bit about changes in both the way we're organising our evidence and some of the developments and tools in evidence over the last 10 years, but they just feel particularly pertinent right now, um, especially for fishing activity data. It's a really exciting time. And then a little bit of a, a just a, a nod to a, a shift in conversations where we've been talking about protection and we seem to be moving towards recovery. 
So I guess I want to give you a feel for the fact that we're at the start of something. Um, maybe for the, the fisheries, we're, Fisheries Act, we're kind of, you know, Brexit was maybe the start of this journey and we're, we're a little bit further on. So maybe 2021 wasn't the start of that. It was a couple of years down the line. Um, but actually, for the thing that I want to talk about next, which is marine spatial prioritisation, we're possibly at the even earlier stage. What is marine spatial prioritisation? Um, it's a programme at DEFRA at the moment. Um, there have been some excellent presentations on this at Coastal Futures and a few other forums that you may well have seen. And it's basically an acknowledgement that our marine space is getting increasingly busy, um, that we've got very ambitious targets for offshore wind. Um, we have ambitious environmental targets within the 25 year environment plan, the environment and the Fisheries Act itself. And at the moment, our marine planning system isn't strategic and it doesn't prioritise. So um, it sort of works on a first come, first serve basis. And I think there's been an acknowledgement throughout the marine sector, uh, including in government, that, that that probably can't continue as it is. So we're starting to ask big questions like what does the optimal use of our seas look like? And that's really what marine spatial prioritisation is about. Um, and the pictures on the right sort of depict that you've got offshore wind, um, commercial fishing and recreational fishing, of course, um, and also marine conservation, um, which underpins all of those other processes. And we need to think about how all of those three things um, operate in the same marine space and while still reaching our environmental targets. Um, so that's why I'm starting to talk about fisheries, essentially talking about offshore wind. And for those of you in fisheries, I'm, I'm sure you've been in a similar position where you've talked a lot about other industries increasingly. So it's also probably worth noting that whilst we have national strategies for conservation and energy, there isn't currently an English fishing strategy, which makes marine spatial prioritisation potentially a little bit more tricky. But we do have a new fisheries framework. So in 2020, we had the Fisheries Act. Uh, I was on maternity leave. So I, that's the first thing I did when I came back uh, is read up on that. Um, and since then, it's been pretty active. So at the moment, the, the joint fisheries statement is out for consultation. And the JFS lays out the policies for achieving or contributing to the achievement of the fisheries objectives that were in the Fisheries Act. Now, I'm just going to move my slide so I can actually see them. So um, the list is on the right hand side of the slide. They are the objectives within the Fisheries Act. If you only read one section of the Fisheries Act, um, I'd really recommend you to go and read the objectives. Um, from a Natural England perspective, the ecosystem objective is particularly exciting. Um, and that is defined as fish and aquaculture activities are managed using an ecosystem based approach so as to ensure that any negative impacts on marine ecosystems are minimised and where possible reversed. Uh, and it also talks about incidental catches of sensitive species. We'll talk about that ecosystem based approach later when I talk about GES, um, but for us, uh, that's a really exciting step forward potentially. Um, Throughout the talk, sorry, I should have mentioned this on uh, the previous slide, I've got this so what box, and that is meant for um, people who are interested in this, you might be um, a local stakeholder, um, you might be a commercial fisher, and you might want to know how you can interact with what feel like quite distant policy processes. So a lot of this is very live. Uh, so in the so what box, I've tried to either make it relevant to the southwest or it's a, um, kind of a, a link for you to be able to actually interact with this. So the Draft JFS is out for consultation until the 12th of April, so there's not actually long, long now. Um, and there are a series of roadshows. I believe that the Southwest is getting visited um, next week. So um, watch out for those. And if you want to find out about the JFS roadshow, um, there's an email address that you can contact or get in touch after this and I can um, put you in touch with them. In the Southwest, so we have the joint fishery statement that's out for consultation and that uh, outlines those overarching plans and policies. Um, it also lays out the fisheries management plans. So in the annex of the uh, JFS that is out for consultation, it has a list of all of the different fisheries management plans that are going to be developed. I've picked out all of the ones that basically apply to the Celtic Sea or Channel. Um, so all of these have quite ambitious timeframes. So a lot of them are sort of kicking off, I think, early conversations now. Um, and these are going to be the primary way that we manage these fisheries. Um, there are commitments to uh, co-management within them um, and a participatory approach. 
um, although we don't totally know what that looks like yet. So that's something that we'll be um, really interested in to see how that, that develops. And it's something, again, I would encourage anyone who has an interest in any of these fisheries or in the wider marine uh, environments to keep an eye out for opportunities to interact with the FMPs. At the very least, all will go to consultation, um, but DEFRA does have ambitions for them to be um, uh, sort of different co-management and participatory models. So hopefully uh, people will be able to interact with them. OK, so uh, an ecosystem approach, uh, as we all know, there are a million and one different ways to define an ecosystem approach. Um, everyone's got a slightly different take on it. Um, what's really interesting from my point of view is that the Fisheries Act use the same definition of uh, the ecosystem approach as already appears in our marine strategy, which is handy. Um, so we're aiming for GES. Uh, and good env environmental status means the environmental status of mar marine waters, where these provide uh, ecologically diverse and dynamic oceans and seas, which are clean, healthy and productive within uh, their intrinsic conditions. And the use of the marine environment is at a level that is sustainable, safeguarding the potential for use and activities by current and future generations. OK, lots of words. Uh, what does it actually mean? Well, it's really interesting that the Fisheries Act points back towards um, the marine strategy because the marine strategy kind of uh, looks at where we are achieving good environmental status and where we are not. Um, and then it kind of looks at a programme of measures to start to, uh, to reach GES. Previously, there's been a little bit of disconnect between the way we manage fisheries and the way we manage the wider seas. And by including this definition of GES and the Fisheries Act, it feels like there's now a much more, much sort of firmer link. Similarly, within the marine strategy, um, it is much more firmly talking about fisheries and managing fisheries through FMPs and through uh, the Fisheries Act as a way of uh, reaching GES. So for things like birds, um, you know, where fish are uh, important prey species. So it's really interesting that that link has been made and that is new and possibly exciting. So I mentioned that there was a, a new approach to evidence, that there are some new tools, and I, by new, I, some of these have been around for a little while, um, but they're really starting to kind of bear fruit. So some of the natural capital accounting work that's happening through uh, the DEFRA and Arms Length Body Marine Natural Capital and Ecosystem Assessment Programme are really exciting. Joe Bays at Natural England has done a brilliant piece of work looking at uh, the North Sea Sand Eel fish, fishery and applying a natural capital account um, that looks at the value of the fishery uh, if it was managed at, as it currently is versus closure and what does that mean for natural capital and the valuation of North Sea fisheries. Um, it's a really exciting piece of work. It hasn't been published yet, um, but again, uh, I'm sure it will be uh, published through Bob L. Roots once it is. Uh, Tegan Telemetry, there's been a huge amount of progress in the last few years through Unlocking the Seven, uh, IBAS, Fish Intel chart, um, and we're learning new things about fish behaviour. You know, a lot of the data storage tagging that CFAS has done over the years. Uh, that's really exciting. Um, I've added in after seeing your own excellent present presentation yesterday um, uh, about the Peltic surveys that he'll be talking about later, you know, acoustic surveys of pelagic fish. And when we think about good environmental status and those links between fisheries and the environment, it's an incredible tool um, and I'd love to see it used more. We have new and improving models uh, from ecosystem models to modeling uh, of fishing activity, displacement, that kind of thing. But all of this, our biggest problem up until now has been that lack of fishing activity data collection, especially in the inshore fleet. And um, there's also seems to be a bit of a fresh approach to evidence um, within government. So DEFRA are developing fisheries evidence strategies that are in their early stages. They've asked me to highlight the marine expert database where you can register um, there's a link at the bottom uh, there that where you can register as a marine expert and then you can you might be contacted for peer reviews of DEFRA publications um, and potentially kind of reviewing grant schemes that kind of thing so again there's a there's a door open for non-DEFRA scientists to interact much more closely with policymakers. but I think ultimately the marine spatial prioritization program really highlights the need for a much more strategic and joined up approach um, especially between collection of fishing kind of traditional fishing data and fishing information um, and offshore wind but that strategic data collection does seem to be happening so the marine natural capital ecosystem assessment program and the OEC um, uh, or, uh, uh, crown estate managed program um, both have kind of large investment in um, data collection to help us answer some of these thorny questions 
So a new era for fishing activity data, I hope so. So I was going to say, you know, we really need good data on inshore fishing activity, really, we need any data. Um, but it's really exciting. The MMO are currently rolling out inshore vessel monitoring systems um, and the under 10 meter catch app recording. So under 10 meter uh, vessels are recording what they catch rather than what they land or sell for the first time. I'm not saying it's been plain sailing. I'm not saying it's all going completely smoothly, but it, these systems have been, um, you know, we've been waiting for these for quite a long time. So it's really exciting. Um, and that will update, this is this kind of map is probably the one that lots and lots of you have worked with, kind of the sightings based fishing activity layers that we've had to use for a long time. And Natural England are also going to be publishing a report soon, uh, completed by MRAG, looking at a risk based approach to remote electronic monitoring, um, which again has lots of potential and has seen quite a lot of focus. So it does feel like, a you know, there really is new data on the horizon. And just very briefly, I want to touch on that, that shift from protection to recovery. So it started off as just a bit of a shift in language almost, but we're seeing it kind of crop up everywhere now. So it's in the Fisheries Act, this recovery uh, conversation, it's in the Environment Act. And yesterday, the government uh, pu published the Nature Recovery Green Paper, um, which potentially could be quite pervasive in changing um, the environmental legislative landscape. I only read parts of it yesterday, so I'm not going to say too much more, but there is a link to it there. And again, it is out to public consultation, which is open until the 11th of May. So I would signpost everyone to it. So Southwest Marine Ecosystems 2021. Uh, I think there's some really positive steps in the policy and legislative landscape, and there are some opportunities for real change. But uh, we all know that that requires long term political will beyond political timeframes, uh, kind of into ecological timeframes. Um, and especially, I think, because we're moving beyond that win win kind of conversation that we've been having for a long time. And we need to start addressing some of those trade offs. And there's a huge amount of work ahead. So I think really maybe in Southwest Marine Ecosystems 2042, when I'm chairing it and I'll look like Rose from the Titanic, uh, hopefully, I hope it looked that good, that good when I'm um, her age. And, you know, maybe then we can look back and say whether all of this change in legislation and policy made, uh, made a difference. I'm a natural optimist, so I think it has huge potential, but we shouldn't underestimate how much work, work there is ahead. I think it's particularly important at Southwest Marine Ecosystems to say that there's really high expectations for stakeholder participation and co-management, um, but that's going to place a burden on all of you. And I think really how that is going to play out um, is one of the things that will really show how successful we are um, in Fisheries 2042 or any of those subsequently. And that's all I wanted to say. So thank you very much for listening. And it feels very strange to uh, not to be going straight to questions but um, we will hold off the questions until the end. I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm gonna pass over to Matt Slater from the Cornwall Wildlife Trust. Thank you. Oh, you're on mute. Thank you, Libby. Um, so hello everybody, I'm Matt Slater from Cornwall Wildlife Trust. And um, I gave a talk this time last year on the first six years of the Cornwall Good Seafood Guide. So forgive me if I'm going to be repeating myself a little bit, um, but this year I've been asked to sort of give an update on, on uh, 2021 and what's changed and what's new. So um, for those who didn't hear my presentation um, last time, um, oh, I can't try and change my slide. It won't let me go forwards and backwards. That's a nice. Sorry, everybody. I'm just going to try and share that again and see if I can get that um, that to work. Hold on a minute. Good. So the aims of Cornwall Good Seafood Guide. Um, so the the project has been set up by Cornwall Wildlife Trust and it was launched in 2015. And it was really as a result of being asked by lots of members of the public and members of the Wildlife Trust for advice on seafood. We felt it was hard for the public to, to access that information. So we decided to start on an information project that would help businesses and consumers make good and well-informed choices when choosing seafood. We brought together information on all of Cornwall's fisheries in a format that we think, uh, we hope that the people can understand easily. 
And uh, the idea was to promote the sustainable seafood available in Cornwall to highlight best practice and hopefully then to incentivize continued improvement. Uh, at the end of the day, we, we really feel that the fishermen and conservationists do have a lot in common. I mean, uh, without healthy seas, we won't have um, we won't have lots of wildlife and we equally won't have productive fisheries. So here's the website. If some of you hopefully will have seen this already on the home page, there's a selection of uh, the sustainable seafood available, but you can see a full list by clicking one of the buttons below. And when you um, if you want to use the app as uh, the, the website, it's also very uh, good on the phone as well. Very simple to use. But what do we actually mean by sustainable? And this is tricky. It's it's a bit of a, a minefield and there's loads of different ways of judging sustainability, as you all know, I'm sure. Um, and at early days of the project, we looked at creating our own methodology and quickly shied away from that um, in favour of actually working with an existing methodology, which is tried and tested and is currently being used all around the world. So um, we're very pleased that we use the same methodology that the Marine Conservation Society set up. And we actually work in quite close partnership where we're looking in lots of detail at what's happening in Cornwall and kind of doing their job for them, but also being quick to respond to new local information and um, using our geographical advantage, being based in the southwest and having good links with the fishing industry. So how do we rate um, seafood? Well, we're looking at these three factors, so stock or species status. This includes estimates of biodiversity, oh, sorry, um, biomass, sorry, and um, fishing pressure. Then we additionally then look at management of that fishery. And finally, we look at the effects of, of the capture methods on the environment and other species. And each of these has a weighting, it goes into a formula, and it ends up giving a, an overall um, seafood rating from one to five, with one being the best five being the least best and to communicate to the public we actually created a, um, a logo a recommended logo um, which can be used by supporters of Cornwall Good Seafood Guide to highlight things from our recommended list and to be classed as recommended these need to be seafoods that are rated one two or three and that we find has been working really well and um, it's a symbol that we think the public are looking for now which is great so when you visit the website, if you look on a species um, page, you'll find details on sustainability, a short overview, you'll find information on seasonality and a rating for each fishing method used for that species. And as you scroll down the page, you'll get a detailed breakdown if you want it on all of the three um, factors, so stock management and capture methods and its impact on the environment. And then there's loads of other features as well. So you can find out where to buy seafood. You can read history of the information on the Cornish fishing industry and history, etc. And uh, there's recipes, there's practical, uh, practical videos to help you get the most of seafood. So there's lots going on on there. And we're pleased to say we've worked with a lot of businesses. And in fact, we've had several new uh, high profile signups recently which is great to our supporters scheme. And this is one of the ways that we bring in some revenue to keep the, the project running, because it's obviously an expensive project to run. Um, and we're very grateful to all of our supporters. So last year, um, there was some really interesting social science research carried out by the team at, at SWEEP um, at Plymouth Marine Labs. And um, Oceane Marcon interviewed lots of fishermen in Cornwall to find out what they thought about the Cornwall Good Seafood Guide and um, eco labelling, etc. And one of the main sort of uh, messages we got from, from that research was that we needed to be on the quayside more, speaking to fishermen, and the fishermen needed to sort of learn a bit more about what we're doing. And I'm very pleased to say that through the G7 project, we've now got in post. Um, Abby Masterson, who's working as a marine business advisor. She's liaising with fishermen in Mevagizzi and the Fowl estuary and, you know, really building up our links and working on project ideas that will benefit sustainability and fishermen, which is great. So a quick um, recap, what's the most sustainable seafood available to us in Cornwall? Well, the ones that score are one and two are listed here, farmed mussels, Farmed and wild caught Pacific oysters, native oysters, seaweeds, 
nine quart mackerel. But there's a lot more on our recommended list. Those are just the very best. Sadly, though, in the southwest, I'm sure most of the audience know, we have a lot of species that are very data poor. And the ones with asterisks are also worth a huge amount to the Cornish fishing industry. It becomes very hard when you're looking at data poor species to estimate how sustainable they are. And that really isn't the fisherman's fault in most cases. Um, and this is sort of highlighting areas that need improvement. So what changed in 2021? Stroke two, well, we've seen um, some of our ratings change as a result of the continued problems with bycatch in gill nets. So across the southwest, the, the, the rating, uh, sorry, the score for, for gill netting has changed now from 0.5 to 0.75 due to continued um, evidence on bycatch of a whole range of species. And that's affected the overall scores the overall ratings for, for quite a few species now, including black monkfish, ling, pollock, sand sole, mackerel, and red gurnard. Um, next one is squid. So in the southwest, we've got two species of long fin squid that are being landed, but for many years they haven't been separated, and this is causing quite a lot of concern. And additionally, um, both of these species fluctuate a lot. There's very little data on them, but the data we do have is indicating that and we seem to be on a downturn, uh, a decline in some of these species. So um, again, it's a data poor species, uh, both are data poor species. They've been separated now and both of them are getting, um, unfortunately, fairly poor scores. But what rate things have improved? So uh, we've had some good uh, reports from ICs on the status of place in the Celtic Sea where stocks are looking more healthy. And um, Chalkort Place, now rated as a T from the Celtic Sea, which we're pleased about. We've also had good um, ICs report on Haddock, which has improved the, uh, the stock score for that and overall ratings have improved. And um, as a result of research carried out by Natural England with the help of um, Cornwall Wildlife Trust and South Devon AOMB, um, which I spoke about at Southwest Marine Ecosystems last year. Um, Pacific oysters have also um, seen, uh, wild caught Pacific oysters have seen their rating improved because of the overwhelming evidence that that species is becoming highly abundant in the Southwest. And then finally, sardines ratings have improved as well. So the Cornish sardine ring net fishery um, ratings have improved from a three to a two. And this is due to um, some great research you're going to hear about in a minute from Jerome, but the um, pelagic surveys have been used and now that stock has been benchmarked by ICs and we've um, they've been able to show that um, fishing pressure is below sustainable levels for that species. So what new ratings have there been? Well, um, one significant one has been Atlantic bluefin tuna. Um, a catch and release fishery has been opened for bluefin tuna, as many in the audience will know. But there's also, um, it's, it's now legal to land bluefin tuna, not to target them, but if you accidentally catch them using uh, gill nets and ring nets and demersal trawls, um, fishermen are allowed to land one fish per boat per day. Uh, so there, and, and they can be sold. And because that's going into the food chain, we decided to add it to the Cornwall Good Seafood Guide. And uh, you know, those are the ratings. And uh, we also have got a new uh, rating for herring um, after hearing that um, several fishermen have been catching herrings hand lining. Um, we had a fish, a, a fish wholesaler ask us if we could rate that. And that rating is a five at the moment due to poor stocks in the Celtic Sea. Uh, so yeah, headlines though for, for 2021. Um, crawfish, we're continuing to see a big increase in fishing effort on crawfish. There's, a, it's hard to actually gain concrete evidence, but uh, you know, hopefully that's going to change. And it's interesting to hear Livy talking about uh, how we might be getting more information on that, but there's a lot more um, boats appear to be switching to tangle netting to target crawfish. And there, you know, there's quite a few fishermen concerned and certainly a lot of conservationists concerned that the management in place isn't really up to scratch. It's the same management we had when they were overfished in the eighties. Um, bluefin tuna already mentioned, brown crabs, 
prices are high, markets and export markets to China have reopened, but the stocks appear to be patchy and there are worries, uh, you know, for, uh, have been raised by fishermen about the state of that stock and, you know, uh, need for better management. And it's good to see that IFCA, uh, Cornwall IFCA are working on a shellfish management plan at the moment. And then finally, I already mentioned, but sardines is uh, great. They're benchmarked by ICs. We, we're quite interested in watching this stock and uh, be interested to hear from Jerome about what he's found this in the most recent surveys. But this stock does fluctuate. And uh, certainly uh, the, 2000, the last report that came through, sorry, were, uh, did show a drop in stocks of sardines. And um, ICs have actually recommended a decreased catch for 2022, which is quite quite interesting and significant. So we're watching that with with interest. And um, I, I know the marketing for them is difficult, and, and it's kind of capped by market demand. Um, but it's still, you know, a slight concern that there's no legal limit on catches, and obviously that that stock does fluctuate, even though we're within sustainable levels. So how could a fishery that wants to get a better rating get one? And um, there's three sort of ways of doing it. You can get better data and get more good quality data on fishery. And certainly there's lots needed doing on that. You can show that there's good management in place to prevent overfishing and a management plan um, that follows scientific advice with catch efforts um, and limits, um, even including things such as protected areas and good engagement with fishers all help. And then finally, looking at how we can improve fishing methods to reduce impact on the wider environment and um, by catch of non-target uh, non species. Uh, moving towards fully documented fisheries, etc. So all of these are going to help improve ratings. So there you go. Thank you for listening. And um, thanks as well to all of the people involved in the project, um, all of the people who sit on our advisory board and all of the uh, people who have funded it and helped get the project started. Um, and uh, obviously our, our friends at the Marine Conservation Society as well. So yeah, thank you to everyone involved. Fantastic. Thanks, Matt. And I think our next speaker is your own, unless anyone else is expecting something else. No, I can present <clears throat> if you would like. Yep. Thanks, your own. And keep the questions coming in the Q and A. There's some really interesting ones, um, which we'll go to at the end. Right, just finding my um, slides. Apologies for the delay. Start again. There we go. <clears throat> Can everyone see that? Brilliant. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for the introduction. And thanks for the invite to present here and to all of you who are listening in. Um, so my name is uh, Jeroen van der Kooi, and I work at CFAS, which is the Center for Environment, Fisheries, and Aquaculture Science. And I suppose that really pretty much explains what we do, for those of you not familiar. Um, but I suppose one of the things I'm going to talk about here today is uh, some of the sort of fish monitoring work that we're doing, uh, particularly that on a survey called Peltic, which is specifically in the southwest. So as I was putting the slides together, I realized that the last time I spoke at this symposium was 2016. So I figured perhaps a, a brief sort of introduction and, and background would be in order for those of you who are not familiar with the survey. So um, the work really started in 2012. Um, it was a DEFRA funded project. Um, and really the aim was to look at the small pelagic fish community. So uh, species like Spratt and Sardine um, uh, have been targeted by fisheries in the area in the Southwest of the British Isles. And, um, but, you know, um, and I appreciate Matt, the introduction of the data limited stock concept, because that was very much the case for most of these fisheries. They were data limited. We didn't know much about the stock structure or the population size. And that's important if you want to manage these fisheries sustainably, um, as Matt so perfectly explained. Now, it's particularly important, arguably, for small pelagic fish, because they're not just of interest to the commercial fisheries industries, but there is, um, they have played a key role in the food web, the marine food web. They're what we call a, a mid-trophic species, which means that they feed on small zooplankton prey, 
and channel that energy up to the higher trophic levels like cetaceans, so the, the, the marine mammals and uh, seabirds indeed. So basically, if you want to make sure there's enough there for the whole ecosystem and for the fishery, you want to manage this as sustainably as possible and you need more data. So that was really one of the reasons. Now, the other reason why we're interested in this particular area is because the southwest of the British Isles is very much a, uh, a boundary between the warmer waters of the, of the Bay of Biscay and the cooler waters further north. So both warm and cold water pelagic species mix here. And the idea is that any change in the environment, for example, through a change of temperature, will manifest itself in a change in distribution by the species. So it's a good indicator species to look at things like climate change. So um, basically, when we designed the survey, it was very much um, more than just the counting of fish we wanted to do. We wanted to really get an idea of the whole ecosystem. And the, it's become more than just um, a fish monitoring survey, I suppose. It's become an ecosystem monitoring survey. And some of the data we contribute on the other components of the ecosystem feed into the assessments there for OSPAR and the Marine Strategy Framework Directive. So it's, it's very much a physics to, fi to, to fin whales, really, sort of uh, project. Um, there we go. Right, so quick map here of the survey area in the in latest iteration. Um, so in contrast to most fishery surveys, we don't just deploy a trawl. It's not as effective in capturing the small pelagic fish community. So we use something called uh, sonar or echo sounders, which Libby kindly introduced earlier. So it's effectively, uh, we, you run along these transects, these black lines here, collecting continuous data on the on the biota, the organisms in the water column, and they provide you an idea of the distribution, but also the abundance of small pelagic fish. Now, I already mentioned the other auxiliary information that we collect, the CTDs, et cetera, which is what we do on those other stations. Now, we've not always covered this whole area. We started off much smaller in the sort of English waters around the Cornish Peninsula in those first few years. We gradually learned that actually for sardine, we needed to expand the, the coverage into the French waters. We had a, a little dabble in the Eastern Channel as well, but then reverted back to the uh, core area uh, that we've been sampling since 2017. And interestingly, in the last couple of years, the Welsh government have um, uh, given us a bit of money to go for the north and sample the Cardigan Bay area as well. Uh, I need to mention marine life here. You see the logo there. They are critical uh, in, in collecting the data on the top predators, the our observers, if you like. Okay, so... Um, one of the highlights of the 2021 survey, I suppose, is the spread story. Um, this is what they look like from an echo sounder. So this is a virtual slice through the water column, if you like. So there's the, the seabed here. There's the surface there. This is obviously 66 meters of water. And these big blobs uh, down close to the bottom is effectively spread. And what we saw this year was this conveyor belt, effectively, of miles and miles of stuff. This, a few more examples here, sometimes a little bit higher in the water column, sometimes these extremely dense schools, um, in this case, a little bit further inshore. So if you plot those acoustic backscatters of that particular species spatially, you get a map like on the right. So you recognize those little lines, the transects that we steam across. The size of the bubble is representative for the amount of fish backscatter, which is sort of representative for the amount of fish, really, in this case, Pratt. And what, what we see here is fairly, uh, partially fairly typical for the, for the survey. So we normally get a, a higher aggregation of spread in the Lime Bay area, and we get a, a bigger aggregation also in the Bristol Channel, sometimes extending to the Celtic Deep. What is unusual this year was that the quantities were much higher, and also the, the, it was more widespread. So we found fish all the way down to the French coast. We found them in the Edison Bay, in Mounds Bay, which is highly exceptional. Uh, so really, really good year for spread. And that manifests itself in, in the biomass as well. So this is the biomass trend since 2013 for the Lime Bay area only. So this is the biomass data that feed into the stock assessment of the species. And what you see is that in those early years, we had good sort of biomass, stock biomass, 80,000 tons or thereabouts. A big drop in 2016, that's after which it sort of um, recovered a little bit, but stayed relatively low at 30 odd thousand tons for this small area here. Now, in 2021, that that number, uh, the biomass basically trebled to 107,000 tons, which is one well, of the biggest increase ever. Um, 
And that's only for the Lime Bay area. If we, if we, if we look at the biomass in the wider area, these are slightly different stocks. So that's why I treat them differently, but that's a three, you know, nearly three times the amount of biomass there as well. So exceptional year. And what's interesting is that this is all made up by what we call O group fish. So these are the young of the year born earlier in that year. So this survey takes place in the autumn in October. All these fish were from sort of April, March, April, um, which is interesting, a good, good sign normally when you get a recruitment post like that. There we go. Right. So the other species that's of interest and one that uh, Matt kindly introduced earlier, which is sardine. Um, as Matt also mentioned, uh, interestingly, uh, last year we had the first ever benchmark um, of, of, the, of this stock. And, um, it, and basically, uh, to cut a long story short, Peltic was accepted by ICs as the suitable data set to be the, the foundation of the first ever stock assessment of sardine in area seven, which is the Western Channel and Celtic Sea. So that's, that's really good news. Um, in terms of the uh, results for 2021, uh, the map on the right is the uh, similar density distribution map for sardine as you saw for sprat earlier. Again, fairly typical. We, we see the highest densities on the sort of English side, if you like, of the Western Channel. Um, increasingly over the last few years, we've we found more and more sardine also moving north of the Cornish Peninsula, which seems to be a northward expansion, which is, I suppose, good news, possibly related to some of these temperature fluctuations that we're also monitoring. On the, on the left, the map shows the uh, egg densities of sardine. So because we collect plankton samples as well, we are able to monitor the uh, spawning activity and those Larger blobs, as you can see, again, um, are concentrated in that ocean front area in the Western Channel. And that front area is, is very important for spawning at this time of year. This is the peak spawning, incidentally. So good news. Uh, lots, the, the numbers were quite high of spawning as well. So hopefully good recruitment again next year. What does it mean in terms of the biomass? Okay, so there's two uh, graphs here. These both are biomass and both are associated with the two strata that you see on the left. So the red uh, line is associated with a slightly smaller area, which is the area that we've covered since the beginning of the survey. And of, as I mentioned, we expanded to include French waters as well, but only from 2017 onwards. So that is that second line. And we know that that's the one that's most relevant for the stock assessment. Now, as Matt already said, the biomass did drop a little bit uh, at 227,000 tons. That's still pretty decent biomass. So very likely the, the fluctuations that we see are very much natural caused by, you know, uh, some recruitment success, some environmental variables. And the age uh, composition of the stock is pretty typical for a, a short list species like sardine, you know, not, not really any um, fish older than six years. And the bulk of the biomass is made up of those younger of the year fish. Right, anchovy and other species, there is no stock assessment for this species. But what's interesting is that um, only a couple of years ago, <clears throat> the French published a paper with the first genetic evidence showing that the anchovy found in the Western Channel and reportedly being caught by some of the uh, by, by some of the local uh, you know pelagic fisheries is in fact uh, a completely different stock from the anchovy that are found in the Bay of Biscay. Uh, what happens is the fish uh, that uh, are in the Western Channel they come to overwinter from the Southern North Sea where they spawn in the summer. So that's really interesting because it means that the Peltic survey um, is potentially a good source for any future stock assessments of, of anchovy um, should there be needed one. And the trend certainly suggests that that may, may well be the case. Biomass uh, on the left-hand side, 45,000 tons in the total area, obviously fairly modest compared to, um, to sardine and spread, but definitely growing. In fact, um, 2021 biomass was the largest uh, of the time series again. And you, you, you can see those two different uh, uh, graphs there. One again, the, the larger area and the other one, the black line, the, the smaller area. Distribution of entropy is fairly similar to that of sardine. We often find them associated with each other. Again, on the very much on the ocean front area in the, in the Western Channel, on the English side particularly, with um, <clears throat> specimens also found further north. Okay, really briefly, some of the other pelagic species, herring, we do capture herring, it's not perfectly designed for herring, the timing is not quite right, and herring is very complex in terms of its stock structure, because of a range of different stocks uh, being, um, you know, residing here, but it was <clears throat> a reasonably good year for herring, we had more than we, we found in some of the other years, but typically found slightly further north in the survey area. 
Another interesting observation for tw in 2021 was actually more prevalent boarfish distribution. We always catch a few schools there in the sort of deeper waters. This is the 100 meter isobath, and that's typically the habitat where we would expect to see some boarfish, but it was more here this year than in previous years. They're obviously a, a deeper water species associated more with the deeper shelf and, and off the shelf seas. And speaking of deeper water fish, blue whiting was quite prevalent. Distribution was very similar to that of boarfish. We, we don't really see them at all, really, in the survey in normal years. So for some reason, these deeper water species seem to find themselves further onto the shelf than normal. And then quickly wanted to mention bonito, small warm water tunid sort of mackerel species, which we started to encounter from two, 2018. And again, we find uh, a small number again this year. We know they're not uncommon in the channel during the summer, but what we're seeing now is uh, specimens trying to overwinter, which is quite interesting. And then moving from the small pelagics to the large pelagics, uh, bluefin tuna. So um, you may be aware that one of our collaborators, Tom Horton, who um, I know is a regular presenter at this forum as well, he published a, a nice paper last year, which used uh, a bunch of different data, but including the peltic data. In fact, the peltic data were, were critical in determining the arrival or the reappearance, if you like, of bluefin tuna in British waters, uh, which happened in 2014. You see some graphs on the left hand side. I recommend you check that paper out if you're interested. And uh, But he used the data that were collected by our marine life collaborators who uh, sent observers every year. and not just recording data on birds and, and mammals, but also on tuna. And that data has been proven very useful as this demonstrates. So 2021 picture from bluefin tuna was interesting, actually a little bit, so the numbers were still quite high. We had quite a lot of encounters, but unlike in previous years where it's fairly widely distributed, uh, this year, most of the observations were actually further east in the Western Channel. So around the Channel Islands and possibly more on the French side. So. Something was driving the distribution at the time, and I don't know what really. Um, so I'm sure it's my time. So um, just to conclude, really, summary for the 2021 20, observations from Peltic, um, spread by biomass is the highest in the time series, a threefold up from last year, uh, driven by this nice new recruitment poles throughout the survey area. So that's uh, very encouraging. It caused a few issues to the local fisheries because the fish were too small to land really. So, but hopefully, um, you know, next year there should be a good amount of adult biomass there, which can sustain future cohorts as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, um, so the biomass uh, decreased a little bit from previous years, but still fantastically high. Uh, with the fishery having very limited impact. Uh, we don't believe there's any relationship there. And uh, anchovy continues to increase, not at the same level of uh, order of magnitude as the other two species, but still growing. And who knows what will happen in the future. We've been seeing some unusual deep water species appearing. And bluefin tuna looking good still, plenty of fish around. Uh, but strangely this year, at least when we were there, because of course that, that's uh, something to reiterate, this is a snapshot of course of what um, of the ecosystem at the time, they were very localized in one particular area. Now, I, I always try to speculate a little bit about the patterns we see. I'm, I'm a bit reluctant to do it now and I probably don't have time, maybe we get a chance later, but one of the main uh, observations again during the survey, and of course, uh, that is not necessarily represented for the rest of the years that the, uh, in that October month, we had a 10 day spell, which was exceptionally quiet, which we've never had before. Rather enjoyable, I have to say, uh, beats the storms that we normally get, but it was definitely responsible for some of the largest autumn bloom that we've seen uh, when we were out there really, which nicely captured by this uh, Neodas satellite map, which shows the high, chlorophyll values down in this patch here, which matched our own observations as well. So yeah, lovely to see. Uh, it happens to be also where a lot of the sardine spawning activity takes place. So um, it's, it's uh, uh, tempting to conclude that that was the reason for that. And then finally, wanted to thank you for your attention. Uh, the, and thank you for the invite and the, a lot of the people in the bottom right there who've contributed to this work. And that's where I will leave it for now. Thank you Fantastic. very much. Fantastic. Thanks, your own. Absolutely fascinating. For anyone that knows me, forage fish are a subject very close to my heart. So yeah, absolutely brilliant. And if no one else has questions, although I'm sure they do, I have a whole list. Um, but we will save those. And we are going to move over to Peter Wills. Um, and I'm going to share Peter's presentation for him. So bear with me, um, but I will let him speak. So I will put myself onto mute and try and share my screen. Okay, thanks, Anthony. Can you all 
people hear me okay? You sound a little bit quiet to me, Peter. I don't know about for others. Uh, okay. Is that any better? Hello? Much better. Much better. Okay, right. I'll uh, I'll speak slightly louder and then uh, make sure that everyone can hear. Uh, yeah, this is the um, doing a presentation. Uh, Peter Wills from Cornwall Council, economic analyst in the um, policy and intelligence team, part of the economic growth service of uh, Cornwall Council. Um, and I'm going to give a brief presentation on the um, the role of the Cornwall Fishing Stakeholder Group. So next slide, please. Okay, uh, the group was established um, back in 2018, uh, initially to get some input from stakeholders into Cornwall Council's position on the Fisheries Bill. One of the, well, a rationale, which is I think quite a sensible one, is that what we didn't want to do was to um, provide input into um, legislation, etc., uh, without having input from those directly involved in the in the fishing sector. And when I say the fishing sector, that covers a whole range of, uh, of uh, stakeholders. Um, meeting frequency increased in 2020, partly due to uh, Brexit, part, um, partly due to the impact of um, COVID-19, which obviously had quite an impact in terms of uh, demand for fish uh, from various sources. And of course, in 2021, we had the impact with uh, Brexit on uh, the ability of uh, people to, to export to uh, customers in the, in the EU. Uh, purpose of the group, um, it's a, it's a sort of two-way process, I suppose, really. Uh, people in the fishing sector can raise issues of concern if they've got um, issues, problems that they, they want to talk about, then uh, we can facilitate that and um, also look at opportunities as well for the future. Um, and reiterating what I said initially, it does provide a, a mechanism for the council to get input to policy. So when we've written up, um, we've responded to various government consultations regarding fishing, etc. Uh, we've had a conversation with uh, various stakeholders to see what they feel about um, issues. And that's been included in our uh, making our position uh, on fishing issues. So we then have you know, discussions with the local MPs, central government ministers, DEFRA, and also other local authorities in Southwest England, we particularly involved in uh, working with uh, Plymouth, have um, involved in their stakeholder meetings on a regular basis. Um, membership, uh, fishers, um, the FPOs, particularly the Cornish FPO, processors, merchants, anglers, association, marine conversation, organizations, uh, other Cornwall Council officers are involved in economic development, environmental growth, ports and harbours, and environmental health. So, particularly over the last year, uh, where there have been issues regarding um, exports, uh, looking at the role of the environmental health people to see how uh, the situation was proceeding in terms of exports and so on and so forth. Next slide, please. Yeah, next slide. Sorry, Peter, I am trying. It appears to have okay. crashed. <laughs> I, I, I might have to come out and reshare again. Yeah, okay. I thought I might have lost uh, voice for a minute. <laughs> no, no, we can hear you. It's my uh, technology that okay. has my well, that's okay. interesting noises. Uh, That where we want to be that's where we want to be yeah thanks, Brilliant. okay well we've uh, got some background data on the uh, fishing sector in cornwall um value landed in 2020 36 million 
Uh, and the value of landings in Cornwall and the Isles of Scilly represents 90% of all landings in England. So it's quite an important um, area in terms of, uh, of fisheries. Quite a diverse fishery, more than 50 species landed. Uh, sole, crabs, monks, and hake being the most landed species in terms of value. Quite a diverse fleet um, operating out of a, a range of harbours and ports. Uh, we've got Newnham, which is the, the biggest one in, in Cornwall, and then we've got very small coves uh, around the coast where um, landings are quite small, but obviously still quite uh, quite important in the area. Uh, about 510 vessels, that's the inshore fleet, and uh, the under 10s and the over 10s, predominantly under 10 uh, vessels in Cornwall, the city, which is probably the case in most areas, and approximately 2,000 uh, fishers. Newland is the, is the main port. In 2020, you had 24.6 million landed, and it represents 68.7% of the total. Other main ports are um, Mebigisi, Lou, and Nuki, not necessarily in that order. <laughs> uh, so it, but essentially, the um, contribution of the various ports in relation one to the other is pretty similar uh, from year to year. Uh, in terms of processing and wholesale, um, 18 SMEs registered, uh, identified, with about 483 full-time equivalents. And the GVA, the output value, is, is estimated at £31.7 million. Pounds. Uh, the process and wholesale market operates for both domestic and export markets uh, as well. So some of it will go into um, local restaurants and trade, etc. And some of it uh, will go into exports. I think we've, we've done some calculations, and it's always tricky to... to they are purely estimates. I think we estimate at least 60 odd percent of fish landings by value in Cornwall and also silly went to, went to the EU. Uh, there are quite important links to other sectors in the economy. Uh, tourism, is one, tourism is one, partly because of um, uh, tourists you know, purchasing uh, fish uh, in restaurants, etc., and also the role of uh, fishing ports as a as a tourist draw, uh, because in many places, um, coastal towns, villages, uh, the fishing sector is you know looks quite prominent. You've got your harbour and you've got the activities associated with that. Um, there are also shared skills and workforce with the wider maritime sector, including flow, uh, the offshore wind activities, uh, conservation, etc. Uh, next slide, Libby. Apologies, same thing again. I'm going to have to come out of share and go back into share. No, it doesn't like that either. Sorry, everybody. There was always going to be a hitch somewhere. There we go. Okay, so if we look at overview of 2020-21, uh, the, the group is engaged in various key activities. Um, and this only covers the sort of main issues because we've had quite a lot of uh, things going on over the last year or so. Um, one was the dissemination of information about the Cornwall Council managed uh, grant support to ensure uptake amongst the fishing sector. So it's providing support doing a quite a difficult uh, time. Uh, there's the Wave Hub, Wave Hub the 300,000 um, Wave Hub mitigation fund investment, which was uh, a consequence of the Wave Hub project of Hale, and some money was set aside to support um, uh, fishers who would be impacted by that, and also investment into uh, Dutchie Fish Poultry Company. So um, it was a small group set up to, to oversee that element. Uh, there's quite a discussion. My screen is gone. Is it me or is it you? <laughs> uh, right. I can still see everything. Can okay. everyone yep. else? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> 
quite quite an interesting discussion about harbour and parking fees for formal council owned ports and harbours. Um, I think the issue there was that you've got various ports, ports and harbours owned by different uh, bodies across Cornwall, and um, fees for Cornwall council owned ports uh, essentially have to have to cover the costs of the provision of facilities on those ports. So. Um, you can get differences from one place to another, but that's something which we uh, we haven't necessarily got discretion about. Uh, yes, quite a big one. Discussion about the impact of the new UK-EU trading relation on fish and shellfish exports and the problems that I suspect everyone's aware of in terms of um, what could be exported and what couldn't, in particular the uh, fact that... Um, Certain shellfish could be exported as they were before because they had to be decorated uh, and so on. And that was causing problems for a number of, of uh, people. Um, we've obviously fed those issues uh, into, into DEFRA. A um, bit of discussion about environmental health certificates following Brexit. And then uh, there's some LEP funding for fishing sector strategy, which I think think is essentially being completed now that was um, set up to um, provide update to uh, a report which was produced some years ago on, on, on the fishing sector and what the strategy for the future should be so it looks at the, uh, the background uh, what's happened and um, the problems uh, potential problems facing the sector and what might be done to overcome those and we've also facilitated a conversation uh, between the fishing sector, environmental NGOs, other elements of uh, the stakeholder group on floating offshore wind development. So we've had um, a representative from um, Celtic, Celtic Sea Power who's uh, sort of outlined what they're doing and uh, why they're doing it, etc. Because there is you know, potential there for uh, um, conflict, possibly too strong, but you know, there can be um, different uh, well because as we mentioned earlier you, you've got uh, the, the sea itself which can provide a, a range of uh, resources and there can be um, con conflicts over how you develop some of those next slide please Libby. Um, yep uh, fishing continues to be an important part of Cornwall's other city world class food and drink cluster uh, significant change taking place uh, impacting the fishing sector, partly due to Brexit, partly due to climate change, adaptation, flow developments, etc. And there's the importance of joint working across public, private and NGO sectors to develop joint response to future challenges and opportunities. And I'd just like to reiterate that uh, the, the function of the, of the group is to make sure that we can look at all the views uh, of, of various elements within the sector to get a, a really good idea as, as to what policy uh, could or should be. I think that's probably it. Last slide, I think. Sorry, I'm going to have to stop sharing and start again. Just so I thought it was working. <laughs> Nearly there. It's okay. Uh, Okay, thanks. And uh, I'm not obviously David Roy. <laughs> thanks very much for that. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you, Peter. Sorry about the technical problems. Um, really okay. interesting initiative. Um, and yeah, I, I wasn't aware of it. So um, really, really useful yeah, to know about. It is. I mean, the, the other thing is, just to add as an as a afterthought almost, is that um, I sort of um, watched or listened to the um, all party parliamentary group fisheries meetings which are obviously quite useful in terms of you know, background information and giving some more information about um, and knowledge about what, um, yeah, what's happening in the sector and various things. So it's very informative. I, I, th I think actually one of the worst worrying things was uh, watching the impact of climate change on uh, various fisheries. Yeah. Um, I think there's one in North America uh, saying that, you know, because fish move, etc., because of changing climate, the impact that has on the fishing sector. So. Yeah, so it's part of the process of 
being able to feed information into the stakeholder group wherever it be. Okay, thanks a lot. Brilliant, thanks Peter. And we're going to go over to, um, obviously not Nevin Hunter, it's Hannah Rudd, but she's going to be sharing a presentation from Nevin um, and then Hannah's going to stay for the Q&A session afterwards. So over to Hannah and hopefully her technology works better than mine. <laughs> thanks Libby um, and, and thanks for, for inviting the Angling Trust today uh, to, to give a brief introduction to who we are and what we do. Uh, the Southwest Marine Ecosystem is obviously hugely valuable to the marine recreational sector um, and thanks to recognition of, of the recreational fishery um, as a sector within the Fisheries Act there's a number of opportunities and challenges um, ahead um, and we really started to, to, to notice those um, at the end of um, 2020 going into 2021. So um, I'm just going to share this presentation. Bear with me just a moment. There we go, share sound. Just had to make sure that was there. Um, so hopefully you can see it and over to Nevin. Hello, my name is Nevin Hunter. I am the Marine Coordinator with the Anglin Trust. Uh, sorry, I can't be with you today, uh, but my colleague, Hannah Rudd, who is our policy and advocacy manager, will be able to take questions from you afterwards uh, once you've heard my presentation. The Angling Trust are the national governing and representative body for all angling in England. We were founded in 2009. We have more than 2,000 clubs with 380,000 club members. Of those, we have 250 sea angling clubs comprising 34,000 members. And individually, we have 20,141 members of the Angling Trust uh, comprising some 4,260 sea angling members. You can see our website details uh, on this slide here. I'm focusing here on recreational sea angling, as you could imagine, uh, rather than talking about freshwater aspects of angling. I just thought I'd take this opportunity to flag up to you the economic value of commercial versus recreational sea angling. According to the government agency's own figures in 2020, uh, recreational sea angling uh, was worth £1.5 billion pounds to the UK economy, compared to commercial fishing uh, value uh, to the UK government of £831 million. Pounds. So as you can see, recreational sea angling is extremely important. Looking at an overview of the years 2020 to 2021, I think it's worth flagging up what we did. And the most important thing we did during that period was to get anglers fishing again as we came out of the lockdowns. Uh, angling proved extremely important for people to get involved with. It was one of the first sport activities that people could actually get out and do. And sea angling was a significant part mm -hmm. of that activity that we were able to get people out there doing. But getting people fishing again as we came out of the lockdowns uh, during COVID has not been the only thing that we've been involved with. The Fisheries Act in 2020 meant that sea angling uh, and sea anglers were formally recognised as stakeholders. And in fact, the Fisheries Act commits to the promotion and development of sea angling. As we move forward as well, joint fisheries statements and the uh, fisheries management plans are really important things for us to be involved with. And really important as well is for us to be involved with co-management and co-design of a future fisheries policy. We want to be engaged in uh, from the outset rather than being involved with at the completion stage of future development. And this is really important to us. Promoting the role of recreational sea anglers supporting citizen science has been something we've really pushed, uh, such as our work uh, through and support of uh, the Shark Hub and we flagged up the work that we've done on citizen science and other areas of work that we've been involved with through our high profile sea angling uh, virtual forums and just as examples of some of the work that we've done on this area uh, we ran a virtual tour uh, around the IFCAS uh, with forums with chief officers um, so we went around nine of the four nine of the IFCA regions and then linked into the Shark Hub, we ran a number of shark related forums uh, aimed at sea anglers and anybody with an interest in shark related issues.
This is typical promotion material that we use for the uh, virtual sea angling forum that we ran with the Cornwall IFCA uh, as part of that, that tour around England, uh, running a forum every month right through from February last year until November last year. Interspersed with the IFCA forums were a number of high profile uh, shark related forums and, and this is the first one that we ran the return of the blue shark with Dr Simon Thomas talking about uh, blue sharks returning to, to UK waters and these uh, forums generated a huge interest uh, over the past year with more than four and a half thousand people either attending or viewing recordings of our forums that have been put on YouTube and our Angling Trust website. So I'll just finish off with some of the key conclusions from the past few years and also look at moving ahead. Recreational sea angling is recognised now as a stakeholder in future fisheries policy. That is absolutely clear. Environmental stewardship is hugely important for us in angling. We see that anglers are eyes and ears for our seas and we see ourselves as part of the solution for problems, not the problems themselves. And we want to work with others to reach shared goals for sustainable fisheries. If you'd like to know more about what we do from a sea angling point of view, we provide a free to anyone uh, subscription for people to sign up to our monthly sea newsletter, which you can do through the Angling Trust website. And if anybody does that, they will be uh, updated on the latest issues that we uh, are involved with, but also as we develop future forums uh, and deliver these over the coming year. Thank you for listening to me. Uh, as I said, I'm Nevin Hunter, the Marine Coordinator, and I'll now hand over to Hannah Rudd, our Policy and Advocacy Manager, who will be able to take some questions uh, from you based upon what I've talked and I've talked to you about. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, if, if I may, Libby, do I have some time just to elaborate on some of the things that, that were mentioned in that presentation? Absolutely. Yeah, we're running a little bit over, but you, that was quite a short presentation, so do go for it. OK, great. Yeah, I just uh, in, in context of obviously being here today talking about the Southwest Marine ecosystem, um, I just thought it was important to flag um, looking at work such as the Bluefin Tuna Chart Programme that's taken place um, and the work that we're also doing through Shark Hub um, in involving anglers um, directly with data collection uh, that can be really useful for facilitating um, plugging those data gaps, particularly for data poor species. Uh, so this is something we're really trying to, to work with. Um, through the Angling Trust. And I, I also think it's really important that building those that rapport with anglers on the ground and charter boat owners is really important um, for um, changing behaviour, whether that's culturally um, and creating this societal norm um, or whether it's through direct uh, workshops. Um, so, for example, we're looking at things like shark handling and husbandry. There obviously can be a lot of questions around that, but actually working directly with anglers um, to, to make sure that best practices are adhered to, giving them advice. So through one of our forums, um, Dr. Georgia Jones from Bournemouth University provided an outline of the physiology of sharks and how different behaviour uh, can impact on them, both detrimentally um, and, and be to their to their be benefit. Um, so I think that's really important. And some of the feedback that we had was just really basic stuff, like a lot of some of the anglers we dealt with didn't realise that sharks have cartilaginous skeletons, they don't have bone skeletons. So bringing them up on a deck is actually quite detrimental to, to their health and can inflict organ damage. So something I think in the conservation space that we speak of quite regularly and we perhaps in our bubble take for granted isn't necessarily recognised. Um, obviously, I can't speak for all anglers because it's a, a wide, diverse group. Um, but that was just one kind of example, really, uh, that we've seen huge benefits with with, with the Shark Hub. Um, and indeed, going forward, we're, we're definitely going to, to, to work on expanding that outreach and education, um, particularly in the Cornwall area. So, um, yeah, if there's any questions around that, please, please feel free to, to send them through in the chat. Brilliant. Thanks, Hannah. That was really useful. OK, so let's jump into the chat. Thanks, everyone, for your questions. We've got some really, really interesting ones. And um, as the chair, normally I would pass on to someone else straight away. But I think there's a couple of quite interesting, um, brilliantly thorny questions for me that I don't want to dodge. Um, so I'm a little bit worried if I don't answer them straight away, then we won't get to them. So I'm going to combine two questions, one from Keith Hiscock on um, do the ideas in Callum Roberts fish recovery areas 
which um, Keith has defined as remove 30% of seas from fishing, uh, get considered at all in discussions about recovery. Um, and then there is a question later from Michael um, saying, what is the position of Natural England on bottom trawling, given that Greenpeace and MCS have openly come out uh, last year on a ban? Um, so I'm sort of going to wind those two together. Um, I don't think we have a definitive position, but I think it's fairly clear that the current level of management isn't achieving GES, particularly in the Celtic Sea. So when we look at the indicators um, for the descriptors for descriptor six, which is seafloor integrity in good environmental status, um, we are not reaching that. So there needs to be more action. Um, I think the green recovery paper that was published yesterday included a commitment to having management in place for the offshore um, MPAs that the Marine Management Organization managed by 2024. Uh, we don't know what that management looks like yet, but that will be another step uh, towards um, kind of management in place in marine protected areas. And I think there is absolutely um, a discussion to be had on increasing management for uh, mobile gears. And I think that needs to happen within the context of marine spatial prioritization. I think if we have that separately, just within our fisheries world, then we're going to get to marine spatial prioritization and realize that we've probably missed the mark. Um, so it has to be one of those considerations that is looked at um, with these wider uses of the marine seas with some really strategic solutions. So I know that's slightly evasive and I'm not giving you a definitive line, but that probably won't surprise you. Um, but yes, and, and also Callum, um, fish recovery areas, the term essential fish habitat, Natural England's been doing quite a lot of research. We've got three projects that are about to be published um, and some continuing workshops this year. Um, and that the thinking around EFH also does pop up in the JFS. It mentions essential fish habitat and protection of spawning areas. So whether that is part of existing MPAs or... Uh, additional protected um, habitat. I don't think we know yet, um, but I think these concepts are definitely gaining traction. So um, I think those are the main ones for me. Um, so to move over to questions for Matt. Uh, Matt, why is capture method weighted for uh, so less, less important than management stock status on the Cornish Seafood Guide? It's quite a good, good question. It's, um, it's a methodology that's been devised, obviously, by the Marine Conservation Society. And it's, um, it's, it's sort of evolved over the years with quite a considerable amount of consultation. The way it's set up, it gives, it gives a position where um, improvement is incentivised. And it's important to note that it is possible to get a good score using some methods that currently have quite, um, quite a low uh, rating for the impact. But the argument is that if those fisheries are properly managed, um, the methodology is less important than the physical, you know, just, just the, you know, the actual capture method is less important as long as that fishery is properly managed. And I think that principle is, quite, is a good one in, in um, you know, um, if we're realistic that you know things like trawling are always going to catch quite large quantities of fish which are essential for economies etc um but with well managed proper um proper um sort of really good management those fisheries can still be sustainable um that's you know that's the basis that that, um, that um, methodology is, is set up on great thanks matt really interesting and another question um why are farmed Pacific oyster rated two when triploid stocks have been found to breed at certain temperatures, thus adding to the invasive problem? Yeah, this is a hot potato at the moment, isn't it? Um, I'm glad that's aimed at you, not me. Yeah, so it's, it's a tricky one. When you look at farming shellfish, obviously the actual farming of shellfish is very low impact. You're not, you know, you're not harming the environment. You're putting filter feeding organisms into an environment where they all they're doing is extracting. Um, plankton etc and producing protein so essentially um, shellfish farming does get a good capture method rating um, it's actually being I shouldn't say too much about it at the moment because it is actually being reviewed um, by the Marine Conservation Society uh, this year all, all of our shellfish farming method uh, ratings um, but yeah we are aware that it's it's contentious I think the evidence is still fairly patchy and Certainly the current sort of large um, influx of 
feral Pacific oysters. Some people think could be to do with fish farming, but proving that um, there's very little evidence. And in fact, we found in Cornwall quite considerable amounts of feral Pacific oysters in areas very, very distant to farming. Um, so it perhaps isn't always as simple as that. We've also got some areas where um, Pacific oysters are being farmed where there's no feral oysters, like such as the Camel Estuary. So I think it is quite a complex situation, but it is one that we're looking into. Fantastic. Really, really interesting. Um, right, we're going to move on to some questions from your own, for your own. We've got quite a few. I've got a, a list for your own, but I'll maybe email those across. Um, so, Bob, I'm just going to go to Bob's second question first. Um, do super trawlers fish for any of the stocks that you talked about? Good question. And we don't know for sure because um, <clears throat> some of the reporting on some of the fisheries is, is a little bit more, um, a bit less clear, I suppose, is one way of putting it. So, um, Horse mackerel seems to be one of the main species targeted by a lot of these vessels. So that's a species we we, we map and, and quantify, but we know that we don't capture the whole stock. So it's not so much of an important species there. Uh, but of course, as we all know, a lot of the species don't live in um, necessarily segregated schools. So it's very likely that there may potentially be bycatch of other species there as well. Um, some of the, we have seen other vessels fishing in the area. The Danes have historically uh, reported reasonable landings of some species, including sardine and spread, um, so, which they don't do some years and they do in other years. So the, probably, the answer is probably yes to a degree, um, but perhaps not sardine as much as horse mackerel, for example. Does that sort of cover it, you think, enough? Absolutely. Thank mm. you. And um, Bob's asked about mackerel in 2021. Yes, good, good point, Bob, and, and so, sorry for omitting that. Um, so uh, the, the macro situation is fairly similar to what we always see. And, and uh, the reason I don't present is because we don't see much fluctuation really in, in the autumn uh, survey series. It seems that it's not the perfect time of the year. We know that a lot of juvenile fish come in to, um, you know, as a, as a nursery area, but we also know it's only part of the nursery area. So whatever we see there, it doesn't give us the whole picture of what goes on, but they were there in normal numbers. Um, the one year I think I would point out that was exceptional was 2013 when we had a very, very large school, which uh, was 20 nautical miles long uh, at its peak, um, which is the only year we've ever seen it. it. It's the sort of school that was reported in Stephen Lockbook's book uh, in, the, in the early you know, decades ago. It's the only time we've seen it. And since then it's really largely been juvenile fish. So, uh, yeah, uh, mackerel, similar story, a little bit boring, I suppose, to, to include. Sorry. That's all right. There's a, there's a couple of other questions for you in the chat, that uh, in the Q&A, if you could, you might be able to type answers. I I'm happy, gonna... happy to, yeah. yeah. Brilliant. Um, there's a couple of, there's one other question that I want to very quickly ask, and it, it might be just a very quick answer. Um, do we need to manage forage fish populations better for the wider environment? Yes. Uh, but I would say that I'm a little bit biased. No, I mean, for, for the reasons that I suppose I, I mentioned at the beginning of the um, uh, presentation, they, they are quite difficult to manage in the sense that they have naturally large fluctuations in their in the environment. So we need to really understand them. Um, often they're overlooked as silvery grey stuff, they're, particularly in English waters and Welsh waters. They're, they're not targeted by incredibly large fisheries. But of course, in Scotland, Scottish waters, they are. And the stocks are a little bit larger. Um, you know, I, I, yes, they are so critical for the environment, so we need to do more. We've got good data here now. We're starting to develop it. There's still a lot we don't know. But yes, we do need to get as good data as possible Yeah, and manage the better. Brilliant. Thanks, Yaron. Can I say one right. more thing, actually? Because and, and, and it's more a, a half an apology to Matt, because Matt raised the sardine uh, ICs advise a matter. And it's actually quite a complicated matter, which I don't have the time to get into. But I think one of the points that I suppose I tried to make is that for a lot of these sort of data limited stocks, um, ICs process and, and see if as is part of IC. So I'm, I'm not, um, I have to be a little bit careful what I'm saying, but I suppose the main point is that a lot of the regulations and guidance that ICES has set out isn't necessarily um, designed for short lived species. And that's something that's coming to the surface now. So we are improving the, 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 how we deal with data limited stocks better um, by adapting the existing guidance more to the short-lived species scenarios that we're, we're now encountering. Uh, but, but I'm happy to speak to you, Matt, on a separate occasion uh, because it is a lengthy one and I 
I have a tendency to go on a bit sometimes, so I want to spare the rest of the audience that. that sounds great. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, um, moving on to some questions for Peter. Um, so Bob has asked, is there, are there any signs that the shellfish export issues that emerged um, after Brexit have been resolved? I had a horrible feeling you were going to ask that question. The answer is I'm not too sure at the moment. We haven't heard uh, much from the uh, fishers for, for a while on that, but I suspect some of the problems are still there, actually. I think it varies by, uh, by species. Thanks, Peter. And I've got a question for you as well. Um, You're on are there any... <laughs> oh, there we go. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, yes. Brilliant. Yes. Um, are there any plans from other, any other councils to replicate the model that you've got in Cornwall? Because I think it's really interesting. Uh, well, like I said, they, they do actually have something similar in, in Plymouth, which is headed up by um, Kevin. Whose other name I've forgotten. For that. <laughs> yeah. Plymouth um, City Council have, have been doing this for a couple of years as well. They have a, a, a similar process and a similar approach. So I'm not aware of, of other local authorities doing that, but they may do. But yeah, we find it a very useful means of um, you know talking to people in the, in the sector and passing ideas back and front, backwards and forwards, and making sure that we're um, we're aware of the the issues uh, affecting the sector. Brilliant. I think only more important at the moment as well. With everything going on. Fantastic. Thanks, Peter. And I think we've got a couple of questions for Hannah. Um, so Bob has asked, uh, are you concerned about any of the southwest fish species? Um, yeah, so I suppose from a recreational angling perspective, uh, some of the reports we're hearing in terms of concern for species is, is pollock. Um, so with a lot of the issues around bass um, and restrictions that are that are going on there, um, there is almost this transition of pressure from bass stocks to pollock stocks. Um, so that's something we're looking to actually investigate through, through a research project at, um, in the coming year, subject to funding. Um, but pollock is actually a really important species recreationally. Um, and, and one of the what some of the reports we're hearing is that the commercial pressure is now transitioning to that stock um, because of bass restrictions that are in place. So I think that's important moving forward. And indeed, when we're talking about the bass fisheries management plan, I think you know, it's important that we look at the kind of the holistic ecosystem and any subsequent impacts that could happen as, as a result of, of impacts at management restrictions on one species more broadly. Um, and then there's always concerns around RAS as well um, and, and the fishery there um, going up into to Scottish <laughs> salmon farms, particularly with RAS, because it's, a, a again, an important recreational species. So I suppose f from our perspective, those are the two ones we're kind of keeping our tabs on. Um, of course, tuna and sharks are also important um, for, for southwest um, recreational fisheries, too. Um, I don't think we have necessarily concerns around the, the tuna stock at the moment. Um, I, I understand that there's commercial interest in there at the moment, and I think there's going to be a consultation maybe um, about how we how we go forward with that. Um, and sharks, obviously, given their their um, their threats worldwide, that's always something that's in the back of our minds. And I think it's we all have a social responsibility to, to do the best that we can to protect those those populations. Fantastic, thank you. And a question from me: um, How well have the Angling Trust been? Uh, involved in the development of fisheries management plans so far? Yeah, so um, it's, a, it's an early days process. Uh, we're, we're, we're quite heavily involved nowadays in terms of uh, high level strategic policy to do with fisheries management, um, particularly looking at the Bass Fisheries Management Plan. Um, I think they're, they're leaning towards a collaborative co-management, co-design uh, process um, from, the, from the government, which is fantastic. Um, I don't believe we've had any kind of early stakeholder engagement on that one yet. I think it's coming in the next couple of weeks, um, but definitely welcoming that with open arms. Um, anything like uh, the fisheries management plans that are to do with recreational species, definitely, um, particularly non-quota species as well, because they're of particular interest to, to the recreational guys. Fantastic. Thank you. Right. I think um, we've answered nearly all of the questions in the chat. If there's anything um, outstanding, um, do you feel free to kind of answer? Um, but anything else from anyone else? I don't think we have any more housekeeping. Um, I think I, there's been previous in previous webinars. If you've got any concerns about 
uh, how you've been represented in your questions, um, then let us know ASAP because I think this recording will be shared. Um, and just to thank all of our brilliant speakers and Plymouth University for hosting us and uh, look out from the emails from Bob. There are more um, webinars in this series. I think the next one is the MPA one, um, which I'm sure lots of us will be dialing in, into. So thank you very much, everyone, and look forward to seeing you at the next webinar. Thank you. Bye-bye.